Uh, this is, uh, I'm really glad that I'm giving this talk here because I started uh, thinking about this thing right after I came to the institute. And uh, honestly, without being at the institute, I don't think I would have managed to go through the literature because there were always people I could go to and ask, what does this thing even mean? So that was really helpful. Uh, all those people include Avi and uh, Max Radzivil, who, uh, and I talked to Yuval, and I talked to uh, Eddie. I, I went to everyone asking, what does this statement mean? Some of the things were in Russian. That wasn't very helping. But <laughs> no, actually, the books were not in Russian. They were just written by Russian authors, but they might as well have been Russian. OK, this is being recorded. I should know that. <laughs> OK, so let's start with the very basic definition of central limit theorem is up there. Uh, so very vanilla statement is that you take n iid random variables, uh, mean is mu, variance is sigma square, and uh, assume the sigma square is between 0 and infinity. And then the classical central limit theorem states that this, that summation xi over n, so if you look at the average of these random variables, as n goes to infinity, this distribution we converges to the Gaussian with the correct mean and variance. So the mean of this random variable summation xi over n minus mu is clearly 0, and the variance should be sigma square. And the central limit term says that we, it weakly converges to this distribution. And in fact, the convergence is slightly, uh, OK, so everybody OK with the definition of weak convergence? Uh, I should actually write down, because I did not know the definition of weak convergence until two days ago. So, <laughs> so uh, xi, we say xi weakly converges to x if uh, for every z in real numbers, probability of xi less than equal to, so the sequence of random variables xn goes there, uh, converges to probability of x less than equal to z uh, for all continuity points. So as long as the distribution of x is continuous at those points, so for all continuity points, this so at every point wise, this the CDF for xn converges to x. Okay, that's the definition of weak convergence. And I'm sorry, somehow this distribution converges in law, converges in distribution. It's a weak convergence. So that's why. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but in fact. The convergence in central limit theorem is uniform in a strong sense. So here, at least as far as the definition of weak convergence is concerned, for different points z, the rate of convergence can be different. Okay? So in particular, if you look at the following quantity, su uh, supremum of z in r, for, uh, take, the la ma take a supremum of z over r, the maximum discrepancy in the probabilities of the normal and this corresponding sum. Just from the definition of weak convergence, even as n goes to infinity, this the supremum could actually need, need not actually go to zero, right? So maybe it is, if just from the definition of weak convergence, it doesn't follow that this limit as n goes to infinity, the supremum, the maximum discrepancy between the probabilities of the normal and the sum, normalized sum, is actually zero. So this need not follow, but the convergence in central limit theorem is actually of this stronger order, stronger nature. Uh, a good question. Uh, uh, where it doesn't happen in continuity points. Uh, so I think uh, some, uh, something like uh, uh, if I consider the random variable, which is uh, okay. Let me try. Okay. So let me define the random variable x n as with probability half it's one over n and with probability half it's minus one over n. Okay, uh, now, um, wait, does this not happen at the, is this the right example? Uh, this converges, uh, this converges to z, uh, okay, you know what, I don't have, I don't think I have an example. This works? I'm sorry? Okay, right. So I, I'm sorry. I actually need some uh, distribution x, which is uh, 
Yes, yeah, so this doesn't convert. So x is a distribution which is not continuous, right? It is a zero at, right. so x is a distribution which is zero with probability one. And now, uh, at zero, it's always one half. At zero, so, so yeah, at zero, it's always one half, so it doesn't converge, but this weakly converges, but it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, I remember reading Statistics 101 lecture notes yesterday to make sure I got all the definitions correctly. Uh, so that in particular implies that uh, don't need to take this definition. Very, I mean, don't need to worry too much about this definition. Anyway, so the convergence in central limit term is actually of a stronger nature where this, you, you get a uniform bound on the convergence rate, okay? It need not be different for different points. Excellent. So, I don't know who came up with this uh, with the first uh, uh, definition of central, uh, with the first statement of central limit term and in what rigor, but Laplace certainly had it in some form, and, uh, but uh, he did not have a proof for distributions with infinite support and uh, 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 distributions with infinite support, and I don't think the proof was completely rigorous. And I think around Kolmogorov people came up, around the time of Kolmogorov people came up with the rigorous statements of this form. Okay. So there are two things missing here uh, in this definition of central limit theorem. One is that this, as stated, this only holds for IID random variables. And secondly, the rate of convergence is not fully specified. It just then it goes to zero, not at what rate. And this is the most of the, what I'll be concerned with during this talk. Uh, another, def another CLT, so another CLT, uh, Uh, we, w I will ca care about the convergence of local central, uh, like uh, uh, convergence of density at one point, but I'll only care about la discrete valued random variables. So you will see, like they, they, I'll only care about discrete valued random variables at some point. So yeah, I'll, I'll get one specific value. Yeah, so it uh, will actually it will also imply like local limit terms. So the density of probability will converge. Probabilities will converge. Actually. Uh, so another uh, CLT, which actually, uh, which I guess came around in the late early 1800s or something, which actually works for non-IID random variables. So these variables need to be independent, not identically distributed. And this was by Lupanov, or at least known as Lupanov CLT, uh, is that for the convergence, you do not actually need all the variables to be IID, just that for some delta greater than zero, for some delta greater than zero, Summation of, expect, uh, summation of the absolute 2 plus delta at moments of x i divided by the 2 plus delta as power of the variance of the sum should go to 0. What does this condition intuitively mean? This condition intuitively means that none of the variables have a super high variance compared to the other ones. Okay? They are all independent. They need not be IID. They need, to be in, need not be I, uh, identical need not be identical, just need to be independent, okay? So this CLT works as long as the variables are independent, they need not be identically distributed. And the condition you require, once they're not identical, just that they're independent, the condition you require for convergence to a normal is that the sum of the two plus delta at power uh, moments, two plus delta at absolute moments of x size divided by the 2 plus delta at power of the standard deviation should go to zero. And intuitively, it means the following. First of all, for any kind of convergence, you require some bounds on how the moments grow. Okay, so if, if the, suppose it happens that there is a random variable whose 2 plus delta at moment is not even defined, like it's a 2 plus delta at moment is infinite, while the, the second moment is defined. In those cases, you're not going to get a CLT. And assume, assume you are dealing with random variables. Let's just say that assume you are dealing with random variables. Okay. So assume you are, suppose, you are, so first of all, you need some notion of how fast the two plus delta s moments of the random variables grow. And assume that the two plus delta s moments of the random variables do not go very fast compared to the second moments. Okay, so I've, I've made the right power. This is two plus delta, and two times one plus delta over two is also two plus delta. And then saying this moment is at most c, some function of c delta, some some function dependent just on delta. Okay, 
So if you assume your random variables are of this form, then what this condition essentially is telling you is that none, the variance of none of the random variables is very large compared to the total variance. So this condition is equivalent to saying that the maximum of sigma i over sigma goes to 0. This is essentially what this wants to express. Okay. So far is it making sense? So this is important that for any kind of these convergence to hold good, we need some bound on how the moments go. So 2 plus delta s moment should be somewhat, should not be infinite where the second moment is 1, the 2 plus delta s moment should not be infinite. Okay. No, if for any delta greater than 0 you have this, you will get some convergence. No, no, I'm saying if for, if for some delta greater than 0, you get a central limit. Uh, if for some delta, if for the same delta this holds, if for the same delta, fair enough. So, so we, are ho we are assuming that for whatever delta we are trying to apply, apply this theorem. Yeah, see. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Sorry. If this condition holds, you still get the, you still get a convergence to the normal. I, I haven't written the weight yet. I haven't written the weight yet. Sigma is the uh, sigma is the total standard. Since x i is are, I, are independent, yeah. sigma is the standard deviation of the sum of x i. So sigma I have defined it like this, but it is nothing but the standard deviation of the this thing summation x i. Because the variance is, if, you, if I have independent random variables, variance of sum is equal to the sum of the variances. Oh, I guess I guess there is some overloading or change of notation here. Sorry. So initially, I was using sigma as the standard deviation of each of the random variables. Since they were identical, I could just use the name sigma. Okay. And no, now I not change the notation to say sigma is the total. So maybe I should put this as some sigma zero. Okay, this is way too high. But uh, let me. Let me change this. Sorry, this was a bad notation. Okay, let me uh, make this sigma zero. Sigma zero is the uh, in the case of IID variables, I'm taking sigma zero as the standard deviation of each of the random variables. And now, for when the variables are not IID, I'm taking sigma to be the sum of the random the variance of the sum, uh, sigma to be the standard deviation of the sum of the random. Yeah, sigma is then for IID variables, sigma is just square root n times sigma zero. Okay, sorry for the confusion there. Uh, I'll be more consistent now. Okay, so now, uh, so all these give you tell you that there is a convergence, but then don't give you the rate of convergence. So the Rate of convergence, so now let me write something about the rate of convergence. So the quantitative version, so the, in, the problem we are really interested in, or the theorem we are really interested in, is Berry Essain theorem. Uh, I guess Berry came up with this in 1941, and Essain came up independently with this in 1942. And this is a quantitative, a quantitative, version of CLT uh, for non-IID variables, okay? Variables. 
and says let be just independent. You, so, you do not need to assume they are identical. For all i, the means have 0. You can always assume this just by shifting the random variable by a bit. Expectation of x i square is sigma i square. Okay. And expectation of x i cube. So, you look at the absolute third moment of these random variables, call it rho i. Okay. Consider the sum S n equals x 1 plus x 2 plus x n over sigma. So, sigma is just again the standard deviation of the sum. So, so this is a unit variance random variable. By dividing it by sigma, I'm making the random vari variance of this random variable unit. And of course, the mean of this random variable is 0. And the Bayesian theorem states that probability uh, S n less than equal to z minus what the Gaussian would have give, uh, uh, from the corresponding Gaussian probability for the standard normal probability of the standard normal is at most order 1 is less than equal to order 1 times sigma and summation rho i i equals 1 to n divided by sigma. Okay. So, this is a quantitative version of the central limit theorem. This is called the Bayesian theorem. And what is it stating? It says, let us take n independent random variables. The means are 0, the variances are sigma i square. I consider the sum x1 plus x2 plus xn divided by sigma. Now, the mean of the sum is 0, the variance is clearly 1. And we want to compare it, to the CDF of this random variable, to the normal, to the standard normal. And it's saying the maximum difference in the probabilities is at most order 1 over sigma. So, this is one, roughly 1 over sigma times this factor summation rho i divided by summation sigma i square. So, it's comparing the sum of the third moments by the sum of the second moments. Okay? And the reason this should make sense why you should be comparing the sum of the third moments versus second moments. So, again, as the, uh, when, when, when is this quantity reasonable? So, so it's, this is like 1 over sigma. Yeah, you, you want roughly want it to be constant. So, what happens? Suppose you are dealing again with random variables. Suppose you are dealing with random variables which are reasonably nice. Okay? So, let us say summation x i cube is uh, less than equal to uh, did I did I miss a factor here? Should this be two third or something like that? Sorry, no. There is an extra sigma over here. I'm sorry. Uh, this is fine. Okay, yeah, this is fine. This is fine. Okay, so uh, 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 yeah, yeah, this is fine. Uh, expectation. So if all the third moments, if the third moments can let's say be bounded by the second moments, okay, so some constant times expect expectation of x i square to the 3 halves. Okay? So, suppose these random variables are reasonably nice. That is, the third moments can be bounded by some uh, fact of the second moments. Then, what does this number? Then, uh, this is, then this quantity is some order 1 times summation sigma i to the 3 halves divided by summation sigma i square times sigma. Okay? And uh, I do not have any more space here, so let me just write continue it here. Summation sigma i to the 3 halves divided by summation uh, sorry, sigma i cube, not 3 halves. This is just cube, right? Uh, uh, this is at most 
maximum of sigma i over sigma. So just there is some manipulation. It's all pretty elementary manipulation. But just that this is, as a consequence of this theorem, you get the thing that if the third moments are reasonably bounded in terms of the second moments, then this has a convergence weight, which is roughly maximum of the variance of the individual random variables divided by the maximum standard deviation of the individual random variables divided by the standard deviation of the full sum. Okay? So in particular, assume you are just dealing with nice random variables whose third moments can be bounded in terms of the second moments. Then this gives you a non-trivial rate of convergence as long as none of the variables have a significantly high variance compared to the whole sum. Okay? And this is the usually, most, most of the times, this version of the, the, even just this weaker consequence, you don't have to start with the third moment kind of thing. Just this weaker consequence suffices for most of our applications in the GSM. Okay? So now what I want to say is that uh, assume you were dealing with random variables which are identical. Okay? Assume you are dealing with random variables which are identical. And the third moment is nicely bounded in terms of the second moment. Then what is this rate of convergence roughly? This is 1 over root n. Right? This is 1 over root n. So I can just take this statement of central limit theorem in the abstract and say that if you have sum of n, let's say just for the simple case, n iid random variables, I look at this sum, then they are approximated by a distribution parameterized just by its first two moments, namely the normal, up to an error of 1 over root n. Now hypothetically now I can ask myself a question. Suppose instead of just being given two moments, if I were given four moments of the sum or ten moments of the sum, could I take a distribution which is not parameterized by just its first two moments but by its first ten moments and approximate the sum of iid random variables or maybe non-iid but independent random variables up to an error of 1 over n to the 5? Can more moments by me be, can get me better and better approximations? And Directly, I, at the face of it, the answer is no, we can't do it for a very simple reason. This 1 over root n is a very tight barrier because of the following reason. Suppose x1 to x10 were iid plus minus 1 unbiased random variables. So they have 1 with probability half minus 1 with probability half. If you look at the CDF of the sum, the probability that the sum is exactly 0, assume n is even, the sum is exactly 0, is 1 over root n. Okay, so there in the CDF, there is a jump of size 1 over root n. So if you are trying to just approximate it by, it doesn't matter how many moments you use, if you are trying to use a continuous distribution to approximate this CDF, the CDF of this discrete distribution, you will make an error of 1 over root n somewhere. Okay? Or you can, you can, or in other words, what you can do, you can just change this example by a little bit, and what you can do is, you can consider two random variables. Uh, let's say you can consider a random variable x and a random variable y such that x and y have their first 100 moments matching, whereas x is supported only on 100 discrete points and y is some continuous random variable. Now, of course, if I take n iid copies all distributed according to x and n iid copies all distributed according to y, so let sx is summation xi, where xi is all distributed according to x, L S S Y is summation Y I, Y I is all distributed according to Y, and N is some fixed large number. Doesn't matter what large number you want to take. Take some. Large. X and Y were just two random variables. I designed to have their first hundred moments matching. Just that X is supported on only hundred points, and Y is a continuous random variable. Okay, and you can always do this just by linear programming or whatever it's called, Cassidy's theorem or something. It's just always just true. You can do it. Then, clearly, the first hundred moments of S X and the first hundred moments of S Y match each other because these random variables have matching moments. The sums have matching moments. On the other hand, by ki kind of the same kind of reasons, you can just make sure that S X has a discontinuity of size roughly order one over root n. Sx will ha can have a discontinuity of size 1 over root n. So, y, where's y, Sy won't. So, 
these two sums, doesn't matter how many moments you match up, they cannot be more than 1 over root n close to each other. Okay? So in particular, they cannot both be approximated by a common distribution better than 1 over root n. Because if they were, they would be 1 over root n close to each other. So, uh, so the question we are interested in, okay, so is this discreteness versus continuity the only issue, like this random variable, some random variable? So we definitely, if we have to answer the question affirmative at some point, we have to take into account the, disc uh, disc uh, the dichotomy between discrete random variables and continuous random variables. I'm sorry? Okay, but again, if you just tweak it by a little bit, it cannot possibly change the, I mean, if you just took some very tiny mass and just smeared it all around the discrete x, of course, you can make it continuous, but the random value, the distribution of uh, summation x i won't change by that, uh, that drastically, right? Yeah, it, it, you have to assume some quantitative form of being discrete and continuous. You have to get some, it's just not saying discrete and continuous. You have to get some quantitative notion of what it means to be discrete. Well, something which quantifies the discreteness of the random variable or the co continuousness of the random variable. I'm not quite sure that's a word. Uh, okay, and the second thing is, if we are down to discrete things, then we have to now think about, uh, again, if you're thinking about discrete things, right? Uh, okay, I have it probably written somewhere. Okay, if you're thinking about discrete things, uh, this brings me to Noga's question. Since I said, okay, I can make x discrete and get it supported only on 100 points, okay? That means the sum of x, if there are 100 lattice points, suppose these are 100 integer points or something like that, they lie on an arithmetic progression, like the support is 1 to 100, then s of x has a support of at most 100 n points, okay? So now if you're going to get a closeness of, let's say, if you're going to get any closeness of, let's say, 1 over, instead of getting 1 over root n closeness, if you're getting closeness of the order of 1 over n cube or something in the CDF, this will also imply closeness point-wise, right? Because there are only n points, there are only 100 n support points. Okay, so this CDF closeness will imply PDF closeness. Does, does this make sense? Uh, well, the probability density function, the probability density function. So if two distributions, which are both supported on 100 n points, let's say both are supported on 100 n points, um, and they're one over n to the, uh, one over n square close to each other, let's just say one over n square close to each other. If they're close in CDF, they must be close in, the, the point-wise probabilities must also be non-trivially close. You will lose at most a factor of one over n. So this also means that you have to, so now that we are thinking about this, this also means we have to, distinguish between discreteness of different kinds. So maybe there are random variables which are supported only in even integers, and there are random variables which are only supported on odd integers. Now these random variables can be maybe one over root n close to each other in CDF, but they cannot ever be close in probability density functions, right? Because one is only supported on even integers, one is only supported on odd integers. Doesn't matter if you just manage to get the moments accurately. So you have to distinguish between a lot of things. We have to distinguish between whether they're continuous or discrete. We have to quantify this. We have to distinguish whether they're supported on even integers or odd integers. What is the periodicity of the lattice they are lying in? You look at the spans of the lattices. You look at the lattice, specific lattices. And we will also look at the specific lattices. Okay. And, uh, okay. Uh, Okay, so the thing is that uh, 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 I'm now going to state what was known and what we proved really. Uh, so it seemed like a lot was known in this thing. Uh, the only thing which wasn't known was the one thing I was looking for, exact quantitative estimates. So what seemed to have been known was uh, essentially asymptotic estimates were known. I will say what do I exactly mean by asymptotic estimates. And asymptotic estimates were known if the variables are iid, and both in case of, as Noga said, both in case of discrete and continuous, asymptotic estimates were known. There were conditions given, but exactly what was the quantitative form of the bounds, and especially for non-iid variables, 
at least I couldn't find anything was known. So most of it is like using existing machinery in the literature to get the bounds that we want. And hopefully the bounds are in a very usable form. So in case you have to use it, you can directly use it from here. Okay, so let me uh, let me say what was actually known. So uh, this kind of like using higher moments to get better accuracy, I guess is known as in probability literature is known as Kramer or Edgeworth expansions. Okay, and the idea is exactly what I said. Like, if you have, you want to use more and more moments to approximate the distribution better and better. Okay, so the first Edgeworth, so I guess Edgeworth came up with the expansion, but didn't prove any convergence bounds. And uh, uh, the first bounds, uh, the first proof was due to Kramer, who showed the following: that let x i b n i i d random variables again okay and now we are going to assume these random variables are continuous and how are we going to assume that it's continuous in some sense we are going to assume that limit t goes to infinity so all these are i i d's i'll just talk about what happens to x1 limit t goes to infinity m scoop x1 hat t is less than 1. So x1 hat t is just the characteristic function, okay? It's just x distributed according to x1 e to the i g x, okay? So this is, okay, so for, for just let me write, I'm not written the same, I've just written what the assumption is. So this is just saying, look at the characteristic function, look at the Fourier transform of the random variable. As you look at higher and higher frequencies, the limb soup is actually strictly less than one. So this quantifies the notion of continuity we are looking for. At least it has some continuous component. It need not be fully continuous, but it has at least some continuous component. Because if the random variable were discrete, then this limb, limb soup is actually equal to one. So if you think about integer random variables, let's say something supported on a lattice on an integer, the Fourier transform is periodic. The Fourier transform of the random variable is periodic. So in particular, this limb soup is actually one because the Fourier transform just repeats itself. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll let me write down the theorem. Then for z equals x1 plus x2 plus xn, soup z in r. So this is just like you're looking at the CDF distance. Probability. Uh, okay, x1 to xn are iid, and uh, okay, uh, assume expectation of xi is zero, variance of xi is at one. Okay, I can always shift and contract the random variable to make sure these two normalizations hold good. Then probability of z less than equal to z minus I'll, I'll write something and then I'll say what is uh, what is important to know. Uh, Z1Z. This says, so assume that x1 to xn are iid random variables and they're all continuous random variables, okay? So that's quantified by the first condition. And then you're saying, look at the sum, normalize it. So now it's mean is zero, variance is one. You would like to say, earlier we said, this is approximated by the normal. This is the normal distribution. This is the CDF of the normal distribution. Earlier we said, this is approximated by the normal with an error. So we were setting, uh, uh, this is approximated by normal, so you are setting k equals zero. 
to an error 1 over square root n. Okay? Now what we are saying is that you can add these correction terms, these polynomials. The exact formulation of these polynomials are not really important, but these po the polynomial p i z is a polynomial in z whose coefficients are dependent just on the first k i moments, on the first i plus 2 moments of the random variable z. So the polynomial p i, this is a polynomial whose coefficients are solely determined by the first i plus 2 moments of the random variable under consideration. Okay? They should be zero, exactly. So if we are talking, if we, and in particular as Noga is saying, so if, if, the, if the moments of the z are exactly the moments of the normals, or rather the moments of xi's are exactly the moments of the standard normal, these coefficients will actually turn out to be zero. But otherwise it's some coefficient. So these are just some correction terms. The exact formulation of the polynomial is, I mean neither do I remember nor is it very relevant what the exact numbers are. It's just that these, the correction terms, the ith correction term depends just on the first i plus 2 moments. In, so if you were considering two different random variables, x1 plus x2 plus xn over root n, and another y1 plus y2 plus yn over root n, and if the first k moments matched, the CDFs would have been 1 over n to the k plus 1 over 2 close to each other because their moments match, so all these correction terms would also match. Uh, which which word moments? Oh, so you are saying, oh, is this is this the actual CDF of some distribution? I do not think this then indeed need not be the CDF of an actual distribution. So the question clear? The question is, in the usual central limit theorem, we are considering the CDF of z with the CDF of a normal. Now we are adding some correction terms. Is it actually a Uh, so, so there is so so now. Can you may, suppose I give you an arbitrary prescription of moments, whether those moments are realizable by any normal? So you're saying first k moments are this, and everything else is zero, or something. The coefficient should be turned out to be zero. Yeah. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I mean, maybe it's true. So not, a, a, not an arbitrary prescription of moment. Suppose I just tell you, is there a random variable with first moment this, second moment this, third moment this, so on and so forth. Does it exist? So there's a condition, like some matrix has to be positive semi-definite. So it need not always be true. Okay. But this is some signed measure, some, some number. The only thing, the consequence we are really interested in is, suppose I was considering another sum of IID random variables whose first k moments match to that of, well, x1, so again I'm considering just x1, then they would have been 1 over n to the k plus 1 over 2, close to each. Yeah, the, I don't actually even care what, what is written here, it, as long as it just depends on k moments. I don't even care whether they're polynomials for that matter or not. I don't actually care, okay? So what is, so there's a sense in which this th statement is, non so first this only holds for iid ra random variables b this only holds for continuous random variables the third thing is that this holds this is non explicit in the sense what's this order it's not an absolute constant it's some thing dependent just on the random variable x1 in particular it is also hiding this condition somehow and how badly uh, what is the dependence so suppose i know this number is not x1 hat t, this number is not, le this is less than 1, but this need not be half maybe. Maybe I know this is 1 minus 1 over log n or something. Suppose my random variables, I'm sorry? Oh. No, this is a specific random variable. This is a specific random variable, but you can consider cases where we are, where we are only interested in the finite statements, where I somehow have designed a random variable, where, which are all iid, and the f you know that this supremum, this is at most 1 minus 1 over log n. And I'm summing up n of those. 
And when I know n goes to infinity, but there's one minus one over log n, we do not know how bad is the dependence here. And this is critical. This is not an absolute constant. This really depends on the random variable x1. This depends on k. This depends on k. So at least this depends on k. But what is worse is that even for k equals 3, suppose I fix k is 1, let's say. Okay, So I'm just considering one more refinement. I do not know how bad is the dependence on the random variable x. That's actually what bothers me more here. That I do not know what the dependence on the constant is. Okay, And so for example, uh, here we knew this was 1 over sigma, but we knew this is how it dependent. This is what the rest of the constant looked like. Here, at least the first statements, nobody came up with what this expression is. I'm sorry? They, they just depend, the coefficients depend just on the first k moment. The, uh, oh, they're, they're very, well, I mean, uh, uh, pi is a degree i polynomial. I think pi is a degree i polynomial. Uh, or pi is a degree, uh, okay, so it's not even a degree i plus 2 polynomial. It's some like super nice polynomial. It must be, maybe the coefficient is like look at the uh, p3, p1 of x might be something like, you know, I don't know, uh, kappa 3 x cube plus kappa 2 kappa 1 x cube, something like this. So kappa 3 is the third moment kappa 2 and kappa 1 are the second and the first moment, so, so in there. Okay, some very nice volume. It's not like super high degree or anything. Uh, does that answer your question? I don't remember the explicit formula. Okay, it's a very nice volume. Well, I think one of the question, one of the things is suppose you're trying to understand the sensitivity of this kind of a statement. Suppose the moments are not exactly matching, but kind of close by, then you need to know what the degree is, what the coefficients are, and stuff like that. So, uh, but it's it's very nice. I mean, the coefficient, the way it's, it's not like some terrible polynomial with exponential degree. Or anything. It's very nice. Okay. So this is, uh, so what we do not know here, for even for IID random variables, we do not know the explicit constants here. Um, I want to know how does it depend on supremum of xit, and I also want to know how it depends on the kth moment. Of course, there will be some fact, some ratio comparing the kth moment with the normalized second, with the second moment. Something like that should also play the feature, right? Much like, and the dependence on the Fourier spectrum. Okay. So, yeah, what is that? so that was actually later on, at least somebody came up with it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me write down uh, okay so uh, uh, actually let me let me write down the next thing for lattice valued random variables people also knew of more uh, of such an expansion uh, again uh, with asymptotic terms that suppose x size again x i i i d same thing mean zero variance one okay and x size are supported on a lattice of maximal span h okay so let me just tell you what it means Xi are supported on a lattice of maximum span h. By this, I mean the following. Xi are lattice valued random variables. Since we are dealing with real numbers, we just mean they lie on arithmetic progressions. And the difference, the common difference term in the arithmetic progression is h, is a multiple of h. In fact, it's just h. So something like if a random variable is supported on points 1, 3, 5, 7, then it's supported on a lattice of maximal span 2. It's also supported on a lattice of span 1 because it's supported on the integers, but supported on the lattice of maximal span two, because uh, two is the maximum span, you, uh, two is the maximum difference you can take, okay? So uh, even some random variable like one, three, uh, on the other hand, one, three, four, six. 
this is only supported on max, uh, lattice of maximum span 1 because you cannot take the common difference to be 2. Okay, 1 is the maximum you can get. Okay, of maximal span 1. If the integers are all, what is the maximal thing you can do? So maybe it is supported with it lies on an arithmetic progression of difference one, but maybe it also lies on an arithmetic progression of difference two or three. What is the maximum you can take? Okay, so that's okay. okay. So that's what I mean here, and uh, note that if if this is indeed true, then X, the Fourier spectrum of X size is in fact a periodic spectrum. It has a period 2 pi over h. So if a random variable is just supported on a lattice of span h, its a Fourier spectrum becomes periodic with period 2 pi over h. Okay. So in particular, that condition cannot possibly hold good. Okay. And I'm not going to write. And something similar is known that uh, under these conditions, if the mean of these random variables is zero, variance is one. Look at z, which is equal to x1 plus x2 plus xn over square root n. Then Supremum of z probability uh, z less than or equal to z or minus. I'm not going to write down what the expression is. It's some expression which is a function of the first k moments of x i. So let me call it alpha one, alpha two, alpha k, and h of z. I'd, and so if you incorporate the factor, if you incorporate h here in the expression, the correction terms will now not just depend on the first k moments, they will depend on the first k moments plus the span. It's important to recognize what the span is. You can get an error of 1 over n to the k minus 1 or 1 over n to the k plus 1 over 2. Okay. I am not writing this expression because at least for the non-explicit part, I couldn't even find the expression in the existing literature. Uh, there was a paper by Andrew Barber and somebody else from Annals of Probability in 2002, where they say this expression is hard to pass, hard to understand. It's not known to most people, let alone be used. So <laughs> uh, this is like a, some really complicated looking expression. Uh, but all that matters is that one, if you are just looking at uh, statements which, uh, if you're just looking at statements uh, where you're just trying to see if there's some convergence or not, so yes, there you can get a convergence if you additionally incorporate some factors depending just on, depending also on the span h. You so these, unlike this factor which is a continuous correction, so these correction terms are continuous, right? P1, Z, P2, Z, these are all polynomial, these are continuous correction terms. Here, the correction terms that are added on top of phi z are actually discontinuous correction terms. Yeah, the, er, the er, h also errors in the, so again, this is not explicitly stated what the error estimate is. It's some order dependent on the k moments and the h. Uh, this is actually applicable to lattice valued random variables. If if a lattice if a random variable is supported on a lattice, let's just say integers, okay? The Fourier spectrum of the random variable is periodic with period two pi. I'm sorry. This thing, strictly smaller, limb soup. So you look at the uh, the if a if a Fourier spectrum is periodic with period two pi, then infinitely often it will achieve one. Right, it will just keep achieving one at some point. So this this condition is not satisfied. Not, not my, but the, yeah, the, uh, one, I'm sorry. It's different. Neither subsumes the other. This is qualitatively. So the, 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 this works for no, lattice valued random variables. Uh, that works for non-lattice valued random. That works for continuous random variables. They're incomparable to each other. Okay. Yeah, the k alpha one to alpha k are the k moments of z, and h is the maximal span. 
uh, alpha k plus 2, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, alpha k plus 2, alpha k plus 2, right. So, th so this, uh, uh, good, good, good. So, um, even versus odd problem, right? So that will, at eventually, that will be incorporated in the mean. So once you have, once you, if you're thinking of a distribution just supported on odd integers versus just supported on even integers, now you have made the span two in both the cases. I don't think then you can make the mean the same, the variance the same, uh, or maybe there's an offset of the lattice also supposed to be incorporated here. There's possibly another offset of the lattice also supposed to be incorporated here. But I don't think you can make the mean is the same. The, exp the expression depends on the first k plus 1 moments, h. And in fact, I think it also depends on the offset of the lattice. So if it's even versus odd, OK, so there's another some gamma. I don't even know how to denote this complicated expression. All I wanted to say, okay, this is probably not <laughs> getting very transparent. What I want to say is that the, the, uh, if you are just interested in getting some form of convergence, just knowing that, yes, it does converge, you can incorporate sufficiently many things. So uh, indeed, in a, in a broad scale, in a core scale, indeed, this di dichotomy between continuous and discrete is the only thing that's mattering. So if we incorporate the first k plus 2 moments and the span of the lattice and the uh, offset of the lattice, you can get error bound. But again, what is the exact dependency and uh, what is the exact dependency and how does this constant vary here? Uh, it's not at all clear. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is that before I take, take the break, I'm going to actually state our theorem, which is uh, going to be more explicit in terms of it, and then we'll talk about how to prove it, okay? I'm sorry? Oh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Uh, no, I, I, I would write down the statement of the theorem and tell you why the error terms exactly look what they should look like, what you would be expecting. Can I write here? Is this? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Okay, let me write it down here for the moment and then we'll. Uh, okay, so uh, then I can. So I'm going to state a theorem which, since we are only inter interested in discrete values, since uh, from the point of view of applications, it's uh, usually discrete valued random variables are more important than theoretical computer science. I'm going to state the theorem for discrete valued random variables. I will say, let x1 to xn be independent. Uh, integer valued random variables, okay? So instead of considering arbitrary lattices, I'm considering just span one, I'm just saying, not, okay, need not be integer actually, because otherwise I can't offset it, so let me independent random variables supported on a lattice of span one. I'm not saying maximal because my quantitative condition error term will become meaningless once the maximum span is not one, but something else, okay? So I'm just saying it's thing, okay? Uh, let me assume that expectation of x size is always zero, so you can do that just by shifting, okay? And let z equals x1 plus x2 
plus x n uh, divided by sigma, where sigma is again uh, sigma square is just well the variance of the sum, so that's the variance of z. Then uh, soup of z in okay. I'm sorry. Oh 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 oh. So right, sigma square is the way. So these are x1 to xn are independent random variables. They are supported on a lattice. So, so their sum is also supported on a lattice, right? And let the, let us call that lattice L. Okay. So I'm now going to give you some maximum probability difference between. Um, I'm going to give you an estimate for pro points lying on L. Okay. Rather than the CDF distance, I'm going to give you an L infinity distance. I'm sorry. It's supported on lattice of uh, uh, some lattice. I'm not quite sure what's what's the question. Uh, uh, z, z lies on a finer grid of of the last one over sigma. Yeah, on a finer grid. I'm just saying, okay. Let let L be the lattice on which z, let L be the be the lattice on which z lies. Okay, is that okay? And now I'm saying maximum of y in L. Okay, probability z equals y minus. Okay, so uh, okay, this is some. Okay, somehow have missed the. Uh, I'm trying to see. I I look at a local, yeah, and uh, okay, I'm trying to f find out where I actually wrote the expression on this side, but. I don't seem to have the expression written down. It missed writing the expression. Uh, uh, e to the minus i c y. Uh, uh, is it okay if I just say this is an expression which just depends on the first k moments of z? I forget the expression. It's somehow not written here. It just depends on the first k moments of, uh, it's some integral, you have to take some integral, it just depends on the first k moments of z. The error term is what is important and the error term is the following. k to the order k, L3 k, k minus 2 plus k to the order k. Uh, e to the minus i square over c. I'm going to tell you what the error terms are and uh, plus soup uh, and then sigma square over beta 3 uh, pi. Okay, let me let me write down what the uh, thing is. So, uh, I'll write down what the meaning of the error term is. Uh, k moments of z, just k moments of z. It no, doesn't depend on the individual. You just need there's some expression. I just don't have the expression written down. Uh, I thought I had it, but. 
uh, it just depends on the k moments of z, nothing else. So let me define beta k i as the absolute kth moment of x i, okay. Let me define beta k as summation beta k i, L k as beta k over sigma to the k divided by 1 over k minus 2, okay. So, and i equals minimum minimum of sigma over sigma i, sigma i is standard deviation of x i, okay, and L 3 k inverse, okay. Let me explain the error terms, okay. Let me explain what these error terms are. Uh, again, for any convergence bounds to hold good, you will of course have to deal with random variables whose kth moments can be somewhat bounded in terms of their second moments. Okay, so in particular, we are th let's think of a simple case when expectation of xi to the k for all the random variables, expectation of xi to the k, the kth moment is at most c times k to xi square to the k over 2. Okay, think about those k these kind of random variables, so they are hyper contractive random variables. The kth moment can be bounded in terms of the second moment. In that case, this number L sub k is nothing but c k, uh, c k to the 1 over k, roughly c, uh, c k to the 1 over k times maximum of sigma i over sigma. So, it is just some constant dependent on k, for, think about k as 100. So, it is some, just some constant times maximum sigma i over sigma, okay. So, if you are thinking about iid random variables, this l k is of like 1 over root n, order 1 over root n, okay. Basically, looking at what is the l k is the maximum, if, if think about, forget about this constant c k, it is just comparing what is the maximum variance of the second, maximum variance of any individual variable divided by the total variance, okay. i is essentially the reciprocal of this quantity and again the same quantity max sigma i over sigma. So, in particular if all the variables have sigma, if all the variables, uh, the maximum variance of any individual variable divided by the total variance is at most epsilon. So, this is the kind of regularity condition that you require that none of the variables have super high variance. Then this is like epsilon, this is like 1 over epsilon, okay. So, then this expression becomes k to the order k times epsilon to the k minus 2. So, rather than where in a central limit term you just got 1 epsilon, maximum of the variance, now you are getting a power of epsilon. This is even better, this is k to the order k times e to the minus 1 over epsilon square, this is even better. So, this is e to the minus i square over 6, i is the minimum value min over L 3 k inverse and minimum of sigma over sigma i. In particular, this expression, if all the variances, if the maximum variance of any individual variable is at most epsilon times the total variance and none and the kth moments do not grow very fast, so we are dealing with nice random variables, this is i is theta epsilon i is 1 over theta epsilon. So, this is like e to the minus 1 over epsilon square. So, this is really, really small. This is like a really small correction term you are paying. This is like epsilon to the k minus 2 rather than earlier we were getting just 1 uh, k epsilon. Now, we are getting k minus 2. I might be k minus 1 or k minus 2, I cannot remember. The only random variable, so this is just dependent on the moments. So far, we have not talked about the lattice on what it is lying, how is it going to affect. 1 over root n. So, think of epsilon as 1 over root n. If you are dealing with nearly identical random variables, this is like root n to the k minus 2. Again, put k equals like uh, 3 or something. I do not think, maybe it is k minus 1 or something. I, uh, uh, 
okay uh, This is the and this is the part which is depends on the lattice. And what is this saying? This saying, I know that the random variable xi's are supported on integers, right? So it's periodic with period two pi. Uh, sorry, periodic with period two pi. Or in other words, between my uh, you look at a principal period minus pi to pi, and then the Fourier spectrum just repeats itself. Of course, the value of the Fourier spectrum of any random variable at zero is one. So you're saying, look a little bit away from zero. How away? Look at zeta lying in uh, zeta lying in sigma square over beta three and pi. Okay, pi because that's pi is the, the Fourier spectrum is periodic between minus pi and pi. And you look a little bit away from zero, sigma square over beta three. That's so again, if you want to think about what is this sigma square of beta 3, it's roughly a constant. Beta 3, if, if you're again dealing with random variables whose third moment and second moments are, are co comparable to each other, sigma square of beta 3 is some constant. So you're seeing some small but constant number. So if, if you're thinking about sigma square of beta, if, if, you, if you just think about random variables with third and second moments are comparable to each other, sigma square over beta 3 is roughly a constant. So you think, look at random, look at slightly away from zero, some constant away from zero, and ask yourself what is the maximum value of, of this xi, absolute value of xi hat zeta. You would expect it will be constant away from one. If it is indeed constant away from one, you are multiplying n such terms, so it will be an exponentially small term. This is the right scaling factor in case you, want, you think about it, this is the right sigma square of beta 3, this is the right scaling factor because if you um, expand every random variable by sigma, this the Fourier spectrum contracts by the reciprocal of that factor. This is the right factor, I mean this is the right order uh, of things. You can convince yourself by various tests that this should be what the factor should look like. I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, you're looking at the Fourier transform of the sum, but the point is ha looking at this product, it tells you why it should decay that quickly. Because you would ideally expect that si it's, zero, it's one at zero, the Fourier spectrum is always one at zero. You're moving away from zero by a constant, you would expect it to decay by a constant. And then you're taking a product of n such terms. So this, in an ideal case, this should be an exponentially small factor, and all you essentially get is epsilon to the k. The, the yeah, this should even give you very good bound. On the other hand, suppose all the random variables were actually not supported on an integer span of lattice of span one, but actually span two, okay? Then you can see that this number will actually be one because then it's not just that it's periodic with period minus pi to pi, it's periodic with period minus pi over two to pi over two. So in particular, pi over two will lie in this interval and this number will just become one. So not quite sure how much I'm motivated why the error terms should look like what they look like. But this is, uh, yeah, indeed, like it need not be that all the random variables should have a good decay. As long as a large fraction of random variables exhibit some decay in their Fourier spectrum going away from zero, this random variable should give you a good enough error term. And uh, you can convince yourself by various things, like th think of canonical random variables and this will look like, this looks very small. And usually this will be the error term that will dominate. And uh, everything else is just some constant dependent, okay? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. No, this wasn't known. This wasn't explaining. Yeah, if you just compare, if you just assume the IID random variable, I'm sorry. Yeah, 
I'm sorry. No, you're not close to a normal, but you're close to each other. I'm, I'm sorry. No, but but the point is that but my point is that I am comparing these probabilities only point wise. I'm comparing, so you cannot. I'm compare. I've written the expression I have. It's only for point wise probabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Why does this show that? Okay. Oh, no, but this is not va this this statement itself won't be valid. But in my case, this is I'm only comparing point-wise probabilities. I'm only comparing point-wise probabilities. And. Yeah, so this, I mean, my theorem is, so it's not like it's more general or special, most general than that. I mean, it's just two different regimes. I'm just comparing point-wise probabilities. Again, because I'm, typically I'm thinking of probabilities which have support between integers, between minus n and n, or something like polynomially large support, comparing L infinity distance and L1 distance, I'm just going to lose one polynomial factor. Which is okay, if I can get a very large one over n to the 50 factor in L infinity, I can just multiply it by n and get 1 over n to the 49 in L1 distance. If I'm only considering distances between distributions which are supported on polynomially large support. This is. Yeah, then it's just meaningless, right? That last error term. No, but uh, th th what you should be doing is if the span of every random variable is actually two, you should divide by two and then start applying the theorem. You should divide by two and then apply the theorem rather than just applying it for. Uh, yeah, you should look at the GCD of the things. But of course, this also tells you suppose I just, like, you know, essentially the random variables are all supported on even integers, and I just t put some very tiny amount of mass on an odd integer. Now you do not expect that the that because of adding this tiny amount of mass, the entire PDFs will now start becoming very close. And this tells you it won't, because this captures quantitatively what it means to lie on a lattice of span one. If it just barely lies on a lattice of span one because of some tiny disturb, like what Noga said, like you add a little bit of mass, this number will be very close to one. It won't be one, but it's like as good as being close to one. So. And then you m product n of them, and then you won't get any non trivial error point. Is the normal proof of the low standard sense of non trivial error in terms of the statistics that you can tell in the proof case that you do Taylor series up to the second term? You do Taylor series up to, so you have to, you do Taylor series after, uh, for, a la uh, for a, 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 like a larger number of terms. You have to be slightly careful about bounding the error terms, and I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything new as far as the machinery is concerned. It's just doing it very carefully. Calculations are done carefully. Normally, I think normally what I could find was people just do it for IID variables. I mean, it's not a new machinery. It's not like some new ideas are introduced. It's just some careful, carefully, things are done carefully. Uh, um, by the time I finished this, I had lost all energy to that, do anything for continuous. So, but I, I think, I mean, um, much of this theorem, sh I guess, if you are doing with continuous, uh, zeta greater than absolute value of zeta greater than sigma square over beta 3, this should be fine. And then you will have to, I, I'm not, okay. One should be able to get an error term where Essentially, this looks like this. I'm not quite sure what is the thing to be compared against. Yeah, 
you will not take probability of z equals y because then it is just meaningless. So, you will have to take probability of z less than equal to y, compare it. But I think essentially, okay, just let us just look at this thing. So, do not assume any quantitative, con I mean, just assume that uh, we are dealing with continuous random variables, and I think one can get this error bound here. One can, or essentially, something like this error bound here. Uh, but uh, the, uh, dealing with continuous random variables is uh, dealing with discrete random variables or lattices, you just compare the uh, Fourier spectrum and then going from the Fourier spectrum to uh, going from the distance. So you show two random variables are close in the Fourier spectrum and then you somehow translate into L1 distance. Doing it for discrete random variables or random variables of an integers, the Fourier inversion formula is much simpler. Doing it for actual continuous random variables, you have to for pass it again through a filter where you cut off the highest frequencies, then uh, uh, the Fourier inversion formula becomes more complicated to deal with continuous random variables. It becomes more complicated, and uh, but I think some of it should be doable. But I'm not. Don't take notes for that. I think we should have a break now. Uh, I just finished stating the theorem. <laughs> Uh, you told me that it's probably good to do some applications. There's no way I'll be able to do the proof anyway. So, why is it useful? So, let me uh, start with one theorem, which is uh, which was already known, but this can we prove it, and uh, then I'll talk about a more uh, application derandomization. Uh, so this was actually used in a paper by uh, Kostas Raskalakis and uh, Christos Papadimitriou on approximating Nash equilibria in anonymous games. I have no idea what anonymous games are <laughs> 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 and a very passing idea of what Nash equilibrium is. But anyway, uh, this is a very clean theorem uh, that let x1 to xn be independent uh, 0, 1 valued random variables, okay? So they're just Bernoulli random variables, okay? And uh, are these, and likewise for y1 to yn. Excellent. And what they showed is that if the first k moments of summation x i match summation y i, then the L 1 distance between these random variables, the total variation distance between these random variables is 2 to the minus omega k. Okay? This is a pretty neat statement. If you have two sums of independent random Bernoulli random variables, the first k moments match each other, then it must be the case that they are really close to each other in total variation distance. Does not require any notion of where, yes, I am sorry. There is no n, there is no n. Just require k moments to match, okay. Uh, so, if of course, this is not necessarily a more powerful theorem than central limit theorem. For example, if you just have k equals a constant then this 2 to the minus omega k. But this holds, does not matter what the variance of the random variables is. You can get a 1 over root n closeness or something 1 over root n closeness by applying these discrete central limit terms proven by Stein's method. But there you require the variance to be order n. I mean, if the variance is, this applies, does not matter what the variance is. This just says they are close to each other, okay. And they proved it you, using some Yes. So you Super biased, like if the random variables, yeah. Oh, the random variables, if they are very large, if the random variables, if the variance of summation x i is sigma, and I am assuming it is also sigma for summation y i, then you get 1 over sigma closeness to each other. They are 1 over sigma close to each other in L1 distance. That follows some discrete central limit theorems. I am saying this kind of a theorem applies, does not matter how large or small the variance is. Uh, 
but the sum can have variance n. The sum can have variance n. So, if they're if they're reasonably well balanced, oh, oh, right, right. The variance is so I'm saying if if they're unbiased random variables, or they're at least one third, two third biased, something like this, there is at least they're somewhat like not extremely biased, not like uh, absolutely zero. It can it can happen that this variance of the total sum is very small, order one or something like that. Very unbalanced, like they're almost. Yes, the variance is very small. And in that case, central limit theorem won't give you any closeness. Okay, first of all, this is saying, this is gives it, suppose you put k equals log n. Right, right. So, so you can. You can, so ideally, one would say, okay. In case that happens, one would try to either apply a Poisson limit. Either I would say it tends to Poisson, or it tends to uh, Gaussian. And which one it is depends on what the variance really looks like. I'm saying, okay, this applies uniformly. To there, you're just measuring closeness. And B, of course, one thing is that you have, you can take larger moments. You can take k equals hundred log n, and you can get closeness of one over n to the fifty or something. Uh, the central limit term just gives you two moments and you cannot, or central limit term or Poisson limit they doesn't do. So they proved it using some existing theorem of Roos, which gave expansions for binomial distribution, for sums of binomial, sums of Bernoulli's gave and proved it. Uh, for, uh, actually this theorem follows rather easily from here. This term follows rather easily from here. I can tell you how it follows. You want to know how it follows? If 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 actually I have a la so the the way you get this theorem from this theorem, you have to this term gives you very good bounds. If you have some variance, right? If you you need to have some variance you are dealing with. If the random variables have very low, if the sum of the random variables has variance one. This theorem is not going to give you much. Okay. In particular, this Fourier uh, term. This Fourier term, if the variance is very very small, this Fourier term gives you nothing. If the variance is very small, the, the random variable, this Fourier spectrum is nearly one at all points, and you will get nothing. So you require some variance if nothing else. To just make this Fourier term go down. Yes. So the way you do it is you consider high variance and low variance cases. Uh, for the low variance case, you just do I don't know sandwiching a problem like some take some polynomials. If, if you know, uh, you divide it into two cases. So to prove this summation x i and summation y i i are close to each other. You consider two different cases. Either you can, either you say the variance is at most square root log k, or at least square root log k. Okay, k is the number you are dealing with here. So you say either the uh, sorry, either the variance is at most square root k, or at least square root k. If the variance is at most square root k, what you will do is that you have a random. So suppose. Uh, you consider two cases. Uh, so to prove this theorem, you consider two cases. Uh, either the variance of the sum, which is equal for both the things, is at most square root k. If the variance is at most square root k, then basically matching k moments, uh, you have the knowledge of k moments, so you can consider these polynomial approximators. So you can approximate uh, the, how do I want to say this? Um, so the variance is at most square root k. Uh, uh, 
variance is at most k. So, standard deviation is at most square root k and the means match each other and they are sums of Bernoulli random variables, then you know that essentially all the mass is, uh, there is this interval mu minus k to mu plus k, mu is the mean, there is this interval of length 2k in which essentially all the mass, all but exponential fraction of the mass of summation xi and summation yi lies. This is true, right? Because if the variance is very small, is at most k, so standard deviation is most root k, and the means of these two random variables match, and they are all both integer valued random variables, so there must be this interval of length 2k, so these 2k integer points on, on which essentially all of the mass of summation xi and summation yi lies. Okay, all but exponential fraction of the mass. So you don't worry about that exponential fraction of the mass. And now, this is an interval of length 2k, 2k integer points. You can construct a polynomial of integer 2 of degree 2k, which exactly like essentially captures this, like you can construct these sandwiching approximators. You can construct this polynomial which approximates the indicator function of this interval super well. And since it's a polynomial of degree 2k, the value of the polynomial on summation xi of degree 2k is just determined by its first 2k moment. So think of k as 2k and this works out. Okay? Variance of summation xi is greater than k. If variance of summation xi is greater than k, then what will happen is that, as I told you, total variance is at some greater than k, what is the maximum individual variance? One or half, something like that, one half, one first, some constant. So, this epsilon, so then we, I said initially, right, somewhere I had done this thing, that then this, all these quantities i and L3s, all these quantities, all these quantities which appear here, L3k and i, these will all be essentially 1 over sigma. Sigma is at least square root k. None of the variances are more than 1. So the ratio of the maximum variance of any individual variable divided by the total variance is 1 over root k. So epsilon is 1 over root k. So you will get an exponential term over here. You will get an exponential t a term again over here. Yeah, so you, you, you cut off, you, you choose the constants carefully so that you kill the k to the k. So you choose the con constants carefully. And this term, as you all noticed, is just the Fourier spectrum of the sum. And the, if you take this Fourier spectrum of sums of Bernoulli's, then there is, it's very easy to see that uh, you can very quickly write the decay. In particular, if z is a sum of Bernoulli's, okay, then z hat ka z is at most e to the minus in the interval z between minus pi and pi, the Fourier spectrum actually has an exponential decay. It's e to the minus sigma square or do you read this, i square, chi square, something like this? This is exponential decay. You can easily show this, just basic, and basic calculus really shows this. This i is a constant, you put this here, you get another e to the minus sigma square term, okay? Uh, it's two to the minus k tight. I do not know, I don't think so. My initial hope, uh, yes, actually yes, it's tight. Uh, because, and the reason this is tight is because if this is actually, you can improve 2 to the minus k, maybe it's tight up to maybe 2 to the minus k over log k or something, maybe it's, maybe there's some gap but not a big gap, because if you can, then it implies uh, sparser covers for sums of Bernoulli random variables, and that will imply faster learning algorithms for sums of Bernoulli random variables, 
but we know of a lower bound, so something happens. So there must be a simpler reason. Yeah, the, yeah. The, I mean, there should be an explicit distribution. Yeah, there should be a simple reason, but there should be a simpler, more explicit reason. But yeah, the point is that sums of Bernoulli's. The important thing is these two terms easily come out to k or two to the minus k, and this part you just do the calculus and see that for sums of Bernoulli's, the exponent, the random variable uh, suffer the Fourier spectrum decays very rapidly. Uh, the intuitive reason is sums of Bernoulli's looks like a Gaussian, right? If it were actually a Gaussian, this is how exactly it would have been decaying. The Fourier spectrum of a Gaussian is a Gaussian with the recipe, with the variance which is inverse of the variance. So this would have been exactly the decay of the Fourier spectrum for a Gaussian. You put an omega because it's not quite a Gaussian. It's a sum of Bernoulli's, but that's why you get to the minus k. Second application. Okay, so I'm not. Uh, I guess I won't have time to go to proof, uh, but let me. Uh, okay, so, and this is kind of the reason. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking about this problem, which is the following. So, consider the class of. Uh, let's consider a very simple case, okay? That uh, so W i is consider the sum summation W i x i and W i is a plus minus one. Now this is a simple case of the application, okay? So if all the x i s are independent Bernoulli's, so independent plus minus one valued random variables. W i's are fixed, so W i's are fixed, but some plus minus one. Okay, so think about this very simple case. Summation W i x i, we know it looks like a, but it looks like a well a binomial distribution. It's it's exactly a binomial distribution. However, what we want to do is to come up with pseudo randomness for this thing. Okay, so to sample, I want to come up with some distribution x i primes. I want to come up with some distribution, some x i prime, okay, which can be sampled with few bits, okay. So to sample x i, I require n random bits. I want to come up with a distribution which can be sampled with few bits, such that these two distributions for any w i's doesn't matter what the w i's are. These two distributions are, let's say, one over n square close to each other. I want a full a plus minus one hyperplane. So okay, this this is very simple. The application actually holds a little more generally, but this this pretty much the hardest case to do. Uh, I'm sorry. So 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 if it, so I so this old old result of Avi uh, Nomnisan and Russell uh, Pagliat uh, sir. Uh, that 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 gets that can tell you how to sample xi primes with order log square n seed. You want to sample x x one x one prime to x n prime with as few bits of randomness as possible, okay? Such that for any w one to w n which are chosen from this, which are which are like plus minus ones, these two distributions, the resulting distributions, induced distributions, are one over n square close to each other. Yeah, yeah, you're fooling, uh, fooling linear, linear functions. You're fooling linear functions, okay? So if you want to think about yes, exactly. If you want to, if you're taking the sum over GF two, we already know how to get get inverse polynomial error with order log n seed. But uh, the, the, b this is a space bounded branching program uh, which can be computed in a space order n. So, just existing results give you that with order log square n seed, you can get order 1 over n square error of any inverse polynomial error with order sufficient 
putting a sufficiently large constant phi log square n. Okay, and the question is, can we get something better than this? Okay, with order log square n. So, a um, couple of years ago, uh, Ragumeka, David Zuckerman, Omar Weingold, and I forget the fourth person. No, no, that was a different one. That was, that was a different. So Parikshit, Parikshit, uh, Parikshit. So uh, they showed that to they can get epsilon error with seed order log n plus log square one of epsilon. Okay, so they can sample. Okay, so whenever I'm saying I want to sample xi primes, I want to do it explicitly. Otherwise, just take a random set. Uh, ju just random random set is fine, but that's non-explicit. So I want an explicit distribution, something efficiently sampleable. So they showed how to get epsilon error with log n plus log square one of epsilon seed. So if you are interested in epsilon being a constant, or even as small as one over two to the square root log n, they get log uh, log n log square log n seed. So that's optimal. But if you want one over n, if you want any inverse polynomial, they get log square n seed, and the fundamental reason why they were getting really order log square n seed when a epsilon was inverse polynomial was that they were essentially doing the following uh, schematic, uh, like the following conceptual transformation. They were saying, oh, I have summation x size that looks like a Gaussian. I will now concentrate on fooling the Gaussian. And then they do something, use central limit theorems and coupled with derandomization techniques. But what goes wrong is the first step. A Bernoulli, a sum of Bernoulli's, a binomial looks like a Gaussian only with error up to one over root n, not any more than that. So, if you just to be safe, if you want to fool it, fool the sums of Bernoulli's with error one over n, the first step itself is that you are doing something trivial. On, I mean, you are doing something trivial. It doesn't a, a Gaussian does not approximate a sum of Bernoulli's with error uh, one more than one over root n, with error smaller than one over root n, right? So. This scheme fails at that level. So, what the, the so what we do is basically we stick to the conceptual schema, but we cannot use a Gaussian central limit theorem. It cannot we cannot use a Gaussian central limit theorem. And uh, uh, because I have ten minutes, I'll probably not do the proof anyway. So I can probably tell you a little more about the application, uh, how to how the application is done. It's a very nice. Uh, so I'm just going to tell you how. Uh, uh, this older paper does it, and then I'll tell. Oh, okay, I'll tell you what. Okay. So, thankfully, I have something written down. So this is Impaglia, Nissan, Wittesen from '94, uh, and it says that. Suppose you have a read once branching program, okay? The width of the branching program is S, okay? So there, it's a read once branching program is a directed acyclic graph, and a layered directed acyclic graph. Every layer has at most S nodes. The number of edges coming out of each layer is D. And the total length of the branching program is t, and you can think of uh, this computing functions, this branching program computing functions, mapping d to the t to some s. And here is how there will be a start vertex. You will move according to the first input, then you move according to a second input, you move according to t inputs, and you land up at some vertex here. So a read once branching program. Starting with a unique start vertex defines a function from d to the t to s. Okay. Okay. And they showed how to get pseudo randomness for this class, which is log d plus lo logarithm of s, logarithm of t, f, they can get epsilon error. So this is really good in the sense that dependence on d is optimal, it's log of d, it's just how much randomness is required to sample even the edges for the first move. What is bad is that the dependence on t is bad. The length, this is like log square t. Okay. So if you very naively apply uh, 
so you can look at that branching program, the one which computes summation xi wi. That's a branching program with width s equals n, t equals n, and d equals 2. And you can apply that, and you will get a log square and feed. What we would like to do, the main idea is that maybe we would like to shrink the, we would like to shrink t, we would like to modify the branching program computing this into another branching program where t is made smaller because the dependence on t is bad. On the other hand, the dependence on d is pretty good. So we would like to increase the dependence of, we would like to use a larger d at the expense of the, uh, a smaller t. Okay, and okay, and sorry. So the main uh, one application as an application of this theorem, we can we can get log to the three halves. We can get the same error with log to the three halves n t. Okay, that's that's what we can get. We can get log to the three halves n t. Okay, and what we do is the following. Look at x one plus x n. Okay, so x one, x two, x n. Okay. Now divide this sum into t buckets okay so group them into buckets of size buckets of size n over t okay so x1 plus x2 plus xn over t xn over t plus 1 t buckets where t equals 2 to the square root log n okay so we group this sum into so we first think of this thing where we think of okay first i am summing summing up the bits in this bucket then I'm summing up the bits in this bucket, and then I'm summing up the bits in this bucket, and then I'm summing it all over, okay? And now, think of another random variable. Suppose instead of sampling the bits in this bucket, so they're t buckets, right? And size of each bucket is n over t, which is Nearly n. I mean, n over two to the square root log n is nearly n. It's n to the more than n to the point nine nine. Now, instead of sampling the bits in every bucket fully independently, sample it with some limited independence. Okay. So instead of sampling, instead of considering this experiment where you sample every single bit independently in every bucket, consider this different experiment where in each bucket you just use root log n wise independence. You sample the bits instead of fully independently, you sample it root log n wise independently. Okay? And now compare the two sums. Compare the two sums, okay? Uh, but across buckets, across across buckets, across buckets is independent. Okay, each bucket I have root log n y. I have sampled the bits independently across buckets. It's fully independent. This is not very good because I'm still using t times whatever is the number of bits required to sample a randomness in each bucket. But then I'll use the i and w. The point is that if I use root log n y's independence, and if I consider compare these two sums, I can apply the theorems over there to show that. These two random variables are, I'm summing this t random variables versus these t random variables, and the first root log n moments match, so they are 1 over t to the square root log n, which is, let's say, 1 over n square close to each other. Okay? No, these parts, these variables are independent, right? This variable is independent from. Across the buckets, there is independence. Okay, I require one more thing to get the Fourier spectrum to match each other, but it doesn't matter. Just think of broadly as if you just have root log n wise independence across in these buckets and across the buckets, there's full independence. I can get 
1 over t. So again, these are like IID variables. So these are linearly like IID variables. So they will, I'll have the total number of variables is t, and the amount of moments I'll match is square root log n. So 1 over t to the square root log n. That's 1 over n square. However, now the next observation is that this computation itself, the altered computation itself, is a read once branching program. I can think of this as a branching program of size t, space n, I'm still adding up numbers of size between 1 and n, of numbers of integers between 1 and n, but in, instead of just sampling two bits at each stage, I am sampling whatever is the number of bits required to sample for each bucket. So instead of just two possibilities, which were corresponding to one bit of randomness I was choosing, now I have root log n wise independence. So d equals n to the square root, d, the total number b, d equals 2 to the uh, log to the 3 halves n. It's because the total number of bits required to sample k wise independence is k log of the size of the bucket, log of the size of the bucket is essentially log n, k log n, that's square root log n times log n, log to 3 halves n. So d is 2 to the log to 3 halves n. You put it here and you sum up the entire thing and you get log to the 3 halves n. This holds for slightly more uh, general things, but yeah, I went really quickly over the last part. Um, Uh, I think hitting set people already know how to do log n optimal, optimally. Yeah, people know. Comment or uh, yeah, people people know how to do it optimally. But that's really like very hitting set specific ideas are used. Yeah, but yeah. The, So no, I remember one. So there was this paper by Amir. Amir and yeah, Yuval Obani had a paper where they get uh, for arbitrary half spaces. I don't think they even require like plus minus one weight half spaces. For arbitrary half for half spaces, they get hitting sets with optimal seed length. Optimal? No, no, they get one over. Uh, they get. Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, and and even for combinatorial rectangles, there was later a paper, uh, I think, uh, can't remember in a prox, by by Shrikant, and uh, to get log n for hitting sets for combinatorial rectangles, you could get log. So hitting sets, are much better things are known. Um, okay, I think it's, my time's up now.